Steve, I know your kids are a little bit younger than mine, uh, so uh, I'm assuming at some point you've been sitting at the kitchen table paging through a manual helping your kid build a Lego set. Oh my God, Legos have been a huge part of the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Uh, Yes, many, many a set. And also many uh, a a downloaded PDF of a set, seeing if we could cobble something together from what we had. You know, that's also fun. Oh, that's interesting. I never tried that. No, I, it, so if, if this sounds familiar, and, and that would always be the case, uh, Max, my younger son, was really into Legos, and he would get these big sets, and then he'd say, come on, Dad, let's put it together. And so let's put it together became me trying to decipher those wordless images, those <laughs> hieroglyphics, uh, and telling him, okay, let's let, let's put this, and he would do the actual stuff, but it was with me saying what to do, and then looking over his shoulder to right. make sure that he did right. it right. And then, and then, you know, backtracking when we realized that we had made a mistake and then going forward and so on and so forth. And uh, if, you, if all of that sounds familiar to you, I've got really, really bad news because I just experienced where it all leads and it leads to a level of hell that's even worse than those Legos. This past okay. weekend, Max and I built a PC together. A computer, a whole computer? from parts yes he uh he he had gotten his first real summer job and he had money you know burning a hole in his pocket yes and he's he's really into uh gaming and stuff and he goes i want to build a gaming pc and i've got the money for it and he'd done all the research and stuff and so we went and we bought all of the components piece by piece the motherboard the gpu the cpu fans all this stuff And then it became a role reversal. He had watched all these YouTube videos uh, on how to do it. And so he's saying, okay, dad, what you need to do next is you need to plug this part in. You need to take that $300 component very carefully and plug it into this one place, not too hard, not, but not too soft or else it won't click. And then if it clicks, you know, it's like, oh my God, did I break it? It was, it took us two straight days, oh. but we finally built a beautiful gaming PC. Uh, it's funny because I had a similar wonderful bonding moment with, with my little one where I went to um, store.apple.com and then I put a laptop into the cart and then I clicked buy and it was so lovely. We spent, <laughs> we spent lo- a lovely amount of time. <laughs> No. Oh, okay. So oh, I, only. I have a billion questions about that. I'm joking about this because I've I've always I don't want to say wanted to do it, but I've been fascinated at the people that yeah. do it. So did you have to get the special gloves that, that don't, don't allow for static electricity and grounded yourself and all that sort of yep, stuff? We, we we had little gloves and so forth. Uh, we and and it was and 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 again we're doing this on a YouTube video, right? So at one point, I've got this huge component that I'm installing over top of the CPU. It's a big fan, looks like a car radiator. Right. And it's got two screws that fit just into this little place, these little brackets that we put on. And so the guy, we're we're, we're playing the video and the guy says, okay, all you gotta do now is tighten those two screws. We hit pause. No problem, tighten the two screws. I tighten one side all the way down, and then I go to the other, and I start to tighten it, and snap! No! (laughs) And I go, no! "Ah!" (laughs) This thing snapped, and I'm like, oh my God, what could what could we possibly have done wrong? We we hit play and the guy says, now listen, whatever you do, don't tighten one side all the way. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> so oh I go, God. oh Max, I'm so sorry. Oh. And certainly, you know, that's what I did. I said, how much did this part cost? Luckily, it was 30 bucks. Oh, and I'm God. like, okay. And I go to Amazon, 30 bucks. And literally they had a replacement part delivered by seven o'clock that same day. Wow. We are really living in amazing times. So, and then, you know, then for that, 
from that point on, then everything that we did, we we let it play until we were sure they were done giving instructions. Yeah. That was the actually the worst thing I did was snapping that thing. Everything else, honest to goodness, we, I, we if we had to do it again, I I think I could do it in in half the time. And so uh, I've a uh, secondary question on my part: How much did you save building your own PC versus <laughs> buying a PC? <laughs> I asked Max that because I was ready for it to be a large number. Like, is it like a thousand bucks? How much do you save? He he looked at me and said, "Ah, one, maybe two. And I said, thousand? He said, no, hundred. Really? Oh, so it's not that much different than a manufactured computer, huh? According to what my son told me. So is uh, the advantage, I mean, obviously the joy of building your own thing is fun, but is the advantage then that you can pick the exact parts you want for your gaming or computing needs? That that was, he he could pick the exact graphics card that he wanted sure the exact cpu he could kind of fine tune it to what he actually wanted but only uh, which was very nice savings. okay well the good that's news that's what he told me but the good news is though it only took you two days to build it so that's good oh my so two days two hundred dollars savings stress. and two days and and i'm <sighs> sure no schwitzing as you put it together oh, that's the thing with God. electronics is you're you're also uh hovering over it and sweating because you're so terrified yes. Because yes. also oh. instructions, it's from device to device. The difference yeah. between five pounds of pressure and 20 pounds of pressure is like yep. immense. And there's no good way to communicate that in written instructions. Like this requires the amount of pressure it would take to close a fridge door. This requires right. the amount of pressure it requires to, I don't know, push a, f- a fat dog out of a doorway. I don't know what, like, what, you know what I mean? Like, how do you, how do you describe pressure? And some of those things, yeah. it's super key, a click versus a crush, you know? Right, right. Oh my God, yes. Every, every time it was one of those, it was like operating on somebody's brain, you know, <laughs> one wrong move. And, and you're, you're, and, and like, thank goodness, the, the biggest mistake I made was a $30 mistake. He had some $200, $300 components that we were connecting yes. at one yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny, though, how, you know, they always say monopoly is like the primer for living in a a capitalist society. I'm wondering if Lego is the primer for living in a society where you've got to put together Ikea and computers and all this sort of stuff. It you know really I mean? was. It really was. It was <laughs> It was like, I, that's why I wanted to warn you. If you start with Legos, you're going to end up uh, where I was at some point uh, wishing that you could go back to the Millennium Falcon. So, gang, look for me wearing stupid gloves and sweating over computer components <laughs> in a couple of years. And I'm going to say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics, I'm Brad Geiger, the editor of the Web Comics Handbook on Substack and the creator of Evil Inc. And I'm his friend Dave Keller, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of the documentary Stripped. And this week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave! Let's talk comics. Let's talk comics. And Brad, I don't want to. I don't want to put it off any longer. I just want to let everybody know my Kickstarter for my Drive book has launched. Yes. I have no Ooh. idea because we're recording this weeks in advance. I have no idea how far uh, along it is. So do jump over to newdrivebook.com. You can get both the fourth book or you can get all four books. And as Brad and I always say. Uh, and I can say this sincerely, I am super duper proud of this book. It is probably yes. my favorite thing that I've ever made. And so I hope you check it out over at newdrivebook.com. I'm so glad that you brought that up because that was a topic that I wanted to bring up uh, for this week's show. And that is Kickstarter rewards. Oh, yeah. Because this happened. uh, This happened several months ago where I saw somebody had missed their goal. And, uh, you know, I'm always I'm always trying to learn by, you know, okay, what happened? Can you can you see if there was a mistake that maybe I can avoid or 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 that maybe that we could talk about on the show? Right. And so I'm always kind of looking to that kind of stuff. And they had made kind of a, 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 a misstep. And I'm like, oh, I can see what I would fix if I were to do that again. If I were to if I if they were to do that again and say, oh, Brad, what should I you know, how, how should I fix that? I know exactly what I'd say. And I thought about it for the show at that point. And I'm like, I can't imagine that that's universal enough that we could use it on the show. And then I saw it happen again. And then I saw it happen this weekend. What's the thing? And I was like, okay, now we got to talk about it. So my question to you, Dave, is how do you know the difference between a Kickstarter reward and a Kickstarter add on? Oh, okay. Well, So for those that might not have backed a Kickstarter in recent years, 
add-ons are a fairly new innovation, fairly new in the terms of sort of like the, I don't know, 10-year history of uh, 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 Kickstarter. I don't know how long Kickstarter has been going. Uh, add-ons are basically an innovation where things like backer kit were a little bit stealing Kickstarter's thunder because you could mm -hmm. back the new drivebook.com book, but then after the Kickstarter campaign was over, and I'm not using backer kit, by the way, but but I if I was using backer kit, I could say, yep, you got the act four book. Now, do you want a bunch of pins and some stickers and some magnets and all sorts of stuff? And people would add yeah. into the cart and Kickstarter realized, oh, we should have the reward tiers, but also allow for the ability to add on this or that small item or sometimes a big item as extras. Right. right? And so. Here is my way of looking at the difference to answer your question, Brad, between yeah. reward tiers and add ons. So reward tiers are basically like the easy one click preset menus at, say, fast food. Do you want just a burger? Bam, we got you. Do you want right. a, an extra value meal that's got fries and a Coke and a burger? Yes. Bam. Yes. Also, you don't oh, have to do yes. a lot of thinking. It's ready to go. We know how much it is to prepare it for you. Here's the mm -hmm. set price. You're got it. Bada bing, bada boom, right? So in my case, I have... Uh, just the drive book, or I have the drive book and all the new stuff, which in this case has like drive ship enamel pins and a travel log posters and a couple other things. And I, I know all the set prices. I know how much it is to ship it all around the world at those set prices. Bam, it's one click, right? But I also then have a bunch of add-ons, which are tending to be, and for my stuff, individual items that you can add on to the cart, right? And I've tried to, as best I can, guesstimate how much the shipping will be if you added that into any type of tier. Here's mm -hmm. how much that would added shipment that would cost, right? Anyway, so I try to work both angles yeah. such that if someone does or does not see, say, a bundled extra value meal kind of a tier, they'll see the add-ons perhaps and get to a version of the bundled tier on their own by putting a bunch of add-ons into the cart. But I also have those big bundled tiers available because you a little bit have to meet people where they are. Some people mm -hmm. are coming to your Kickstarter on a phone. Some people are coming on an iPad. Some people are coming on a computer. And honestly, on a phone, sometimes some of the nuances and extras of a Kickstarter campaign can get lost. So... You have yeah. to add all the stuff that you had in the bundle tiers into the into the add-ons, and you have to have right. all the add-ons also in bundle tiers on the main reward tiers. So, is it more confusing for you? Yes, but as Brad yeah. and I have always said, you got to take fifteen to thirty days to prep for a Kickstarter campaign. Work yes, out all do. the shipping. Work out all the logistics. Work out how you're going to do it, and have it so that both the add-ons exist in the reward tiers as special higher bundled tiers. Or and or no, not not or and also exist as individual add ons. Yes, that is the and, and by the way, I just want to go back and highlight your idea of uh, ordering at a fast food restaurant. You can yes. add a burger or you can add, order the burger meal right. or you can supersize it. That's a really good metaphor for what we're talking about. Because the uh, the reason that these Kickstarters had lost their goal, that, right. that they had not met their goal, was because they didn't have the Kickstarter ladder set up that, that would walk people up the ladder. Yes. Or, they had tiers, but the jumps were, were huge. And a lot of times they were giving away things like original art for only a, a, an added on value of like $15. By the time you get to original art, even if it's a little five by seven sketch card, that that's worth a lot more than fifteen bucks. That that's that's worth a hundred bucks. If it's original art, right. like a like a strip or a page, we're talking two three hundred bucks. You should be getting your bang, literally your bang for your buck out of that those originals. Same thing for artist editions and and, and commissions and stuff like that. Those are farther down mm -hmm. or farther up in this case your Kickstarter ladder. And what I saw was a lot of people, they had all the add-ons. And, and remember what Dave was just telling you, he uses them for both, which is the right thing to do. But those add-ons, a lot of times get hidden. They, they, you don't, in other words, you don't see the add-on until you're act, actively made the uh, the decision to buy one of those reward tiers. Right, you actually right. clicked it. 
the, until then, they're hidden. And that's really important for you to understand. Those add-ons are hidden until that person makes the commitment. So I think I, you and I would both advise, especially if we're in a situation where like you're doing volume two of, 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 a, of a series, that volume one needs to be part of a Kickstarter reward tier number one to walk them up the ladder yep. number two just to show people that it's there yeah and also exactly and also just for all the folks that are new to brad or dave or you and yes. your title right you can't just assume yeah. that these are all recurrent returning customers there's going to be some new ones that's the ideal goal is that there's some new ones so yes, yes brad to show them that it's there to give them the options and remember that one of the reasons why let's say denny's has a big visual menu and one of the yeah. reasons why M&Ms has multiple colors, they could very easily all just be brown or black, right? right. Yes. Here's the thing. Psychologically, this has been proven again and again, you will eat more M&Ms if they are multiple colors. And right. you are more likely to buy more if menus are visual and presented pleasingly, right? So, yep. uh, and as Brad says, moving them up the ladder visually. So... I see the temptation for a lot of people to say, I'm doing a simple Kickstarter. It's one mm -hmm. book, bada bing, bada boom, I'm out, right? Here's the thing. Sometimes the perception of choice makes people actually spend more money. So you could say, yes. I've got a $30 book. That's all it is. That's the whole Kickstarter. Do you want to do Just the $30 the book? book? Mm -hmm. Good, you're in. Then great, let's keep going. Here's the thing. You'll make more money Odd, it's odd, but you will. You'll make more money and oddly enough have people who move up the ladder if you say there's a $15 ebook, a $30 book, and yep. a $45 book with extra stuff in it, right? Like, so yep. you can choose either one. You're going to find that your average percentage will go higher than $30 having done that and that yeah. more people will be enticed to jump in on the Kickstarter. It's a weird bit of human psychology mm -hmm. that both more people get to a yes and more people spend more money when there is choice and variety uh, expressed in your menu, in this case being the Kickstarter display of all the reward tiers that you have. So yeah, it's, I do, do, do understand the compulsion to want to do a quote, simple Kickstarter. It's just mm -hmm. a book. It's just right. a DVD. It's just a bumper sticker. That's the whole Kickstarter. But having variety like M&M bowls do uh, and having the ability to work people up the ladder like a good Kickstarter does, yes. and meeting people where they are with the recognition that not everybody will see all the reward tiers, not everybody will see all the add-ons. So you mm -hmm. gotta kind of have both in both. That gets you to a higher final number. Um, so, and it, it's honestly, it's good practice for you in your pricing also to see yes. what is it worth it to me to have someone jump right. in in a bundled price. What is it worth it to me to have someone add on this thing after they've already agreed to a reward tier? And so it'll be good practice for you to work out the math of that for, our, for your own needs. Yeah. Now, you might be listening at home and saying, oh, OK, Dave Kellett tells us about the M&Ms. So now I also got to go out and, and, and have a bunch of enamel pins made and I have to have a bunch of these other pieces of merchandise made. And all I'm going to tell you in that case is. OK, if you want to do that and if you think it's a good fit for your audience and, and, and you have an indication that there's the demand there. Great. However, be very careful when you're doing stuff like this and make sure that you wrap all of that into your original Kickstarter goal, because yes, if now yes, you're yes. going to have enamel pins oh God, made. Yes. That's going to go against your goal. Now you got to make your goal higher, right, right? Right. So it's one thing if you're like Dave and you've got all this stuff in a storage area ready to go over years of producing merchandise. That's that's one thing. But if you don't have it, then you do have to scale back or at least add that stuff into your Kickstarter goal. Because I've seen so many people get underwater, either with a, a, a putting a bunch of this junk on or I've seen people do the same thing with stretch goals. Right. And, and by the way, there's this hysteria that happens midway through your Kickstarter. If you're lucky enough to hit your goal by like the halfway mark. 
because now it's like, oh, I've got to do stretch goals. I got to, I got to have, oh, if we have this stretch goal, then I'll give you this. And if we have this stretch goal, and, I'll, and, and it, it's almost like somebody, like a young person courting a lover. And, and if you go to the prom, I'll be the best person. I'll be the best date and I'll get you a limousine. Did yes. I say limousine? Yes. I meant a limousine and flowers. Did I say limousine and flowers? I meant a limousine and flowers and a marching band. Yes. And, and you go on and on and on. Those stretch goals. And Dave, by the way, speaking of hysteria, last time I did a Kickstarter, I, I was kind of like, oh, I'm done with these stretch goals. And Dave, like, you've got so much stuff, digital stuff that yes, doesn't cost stuff. you anything. Yeah. Just put a stretch goal up that's digital. And it's so you have something to talk about, right? Yeah. Uh, and and he was absolutely right on that point. Uh, but yeah, any of those stretch goals that you're doing, <laughs> you know you've what's got to make sure that you're accounting for that in your total. It's also just a side note to this. It's yeah. it's funny and sweet how many times on the show uh, the truth comes out that one of us is just anxious and and stressed, oh, and the other one goes, yeah. "Here's the simple solution. Just do this. Yeah." Just do this. Yeah. We've had it with okay. Brad doing it for me. I'm doing it for yep. Brad. It's lovely to yep. have that where you're just like, oh, right. I can just do digital reward tiers. That's fine. By the way, digital yeah. reward tiers, just to underline that, is a great option. Costs you nothing. Oh. There's like five different ways you could distribute it at no cost to you. Um, and it's a perceived value. It still feels like an item because remember, on a on a screen, a digital item presents just the same as a physical item. So people are like, oh, yes. hooray, I'm getting the blankety blank. How wonderful. <gasps> Um, anyway, all that to be said, uh, yes, to Brad's point that don't just add on things just for the sake of adding them on. Make sure yeah. that there is a profit to them. A reminder yeah. that I try to price my items so that they are five times what they cost me. If you want to be safe, you could do six times what they cost you. Mm -hmm. So if a pin costs mm -hmm. me two or three bucks to make, the cost, the price to the consumer is going to be 10 to 12 bucks. So you can't have add on items or stretch goal items or reward tier items where you're like, look, I'm adding a pin, but I'm losing $5 every time I do it, but I'll make it yeah. up on volume. So the more I sell, well, hold yeah. on, hold on, let me do the math on that. Wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> so you want to be making a profit anytime you have all these little extra tchotchkes in your yeah. Kickstarter reward. But as your career goes on and you do more than one Kickstarter, you'll find that the leftovers from the last Kickstarter can be rolled into this one. So the pins that I have from my last book can be rolled in as add-ons to this one. And it's a great way to sort of have knock-on sales uh, for something that's essentially already bought. You know, I bought it yeah. a year ago, two years ago for the last Kickstarter. Um, but again, to Brad's point, don't just add it in just to add it in. Do yeah. the math on it. Make sure your economics make sense. Yeah, absolutely. And before we go to the next topic, I just want to underline digital rewards. I did a whole post on this for the Web Comics Handbook, where my last Kickstarter digital rewards were like somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of my Kickstarter uh, earnings. Yeah, was, it's significant. And, and the beautiful thing about that is what's the other side of that? No shipping. Right. That's just free money that those are PDFs. I send yeah. a link. Yes. Bang, you got yeah. it. Jeff's done. Kiss. 25 to 30% of my Kickstarter was digital only rewards. Yeah. Do not sleep on those. Don't sleep they're, on they're those. way more powerful than you're giving them credit for. Let me ask you this, Brad, because you kickstarted in the last six months. Um, yeah. Did the post campaign sales exist yet on Kickstarter? The sort of backer kit? I was just, they were just in beta on that. Right. And I asked if I could be included and uh, they gave me a very polite no. Oh, okay. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm actually not sure over at newdrivebook.com whether or not I will qualify. I don't know yet if it's out of beta. Um, yeah. So I'm curious about that. And I will let the show know how that goes because that's a fairly new innovation. Again, kind of taken yeah. from Backer Kit. But um, I invite any of everyone to go over to newdrivebook.com and have a look at how I set up, to Brad's point, the reward tiers versus the add-ons. Yeah. Like, you don't have to back. Just go through a fake thing of putting things in your cart and see how we did it. Because Beth and I spent the better part of a month, month and a half prepping for this Kickstarter. So there, a mm -hmm. lot of thought went into this. And so you can ask us things like, hey, why did you do it this way? That And, and we, you know, if it's a good enough question, Brad and I will bring it onto the show and we'll talk yeah. about it because structuring a Kickstarter is a unique experience for a cartoonist. And uh, but again, to reiterate Brad's point, reward tiers are the sort of, you know, the big lump sum jump in value menu kind of bundled things. 
for yeah. which you want to represent all the different uh, tiers, price tiers uh, that your readers could want to jump in on. And then also some of the exact same things that are in those different bundled reward tiers you're going to yep. have on add-ons. And some mm -hmm. of those add-ons will be on and vice versa will be in the reward tiers. So don't just do one for the other to Brad's point, because otherwise you're going to find that they're hidden to some of your readers. Absolutely. I, hey, I've got one thing I'd like to add on okay. right now. I'd like to add on that uh, this is a great time for you. I think there's still a little bit of time for you to join us in San Diego for yes. the National Cartoonist Society Rumen Awards, where Dave and I are going to be doing two big live show. Uh, we've been we've been uh, reaching out to some guests. We've got some amazing guests that we're going to be telling you about pretty soon. Yes, but uh, it, it's going to be live on stage at the Comic Con Museum Theater over there in San Diego, uh, and we're, we'll be doing two amazing talk show style uh, uh, shows. And I'm telling you, you don't want to miss it. So if you're not a member yet, you're still got some time. It's getting pretty close at this point. You're going to have to really hustle, but you can still meet us down there at the NCS uh, Ruben Awards week. And I'm telling you, we're, we're going to have some amazing stories when we get back. I, I That's going to be a lot of fun. And it's going to be especially fun because we're doing it in the San Diego Comic-Con Museum, which is the new facility uh i and that's going to be fun and it's fun just yeah. for us because what's fun brad is we're slowly ticking off all the check boxes of all the sort of popular comic spaces in america yeah we've done featured talks at san diego comic-con we did the mm -hmm. schultz museum the peanuts museum up in santa rosa um uh, now we're going to be doing the ncs this two header at the comic-con museum now yeah. we really just need ohio state if you're listening we need to we need to come oh, out to ohio yes. state uh, SCAD, oh. if you're listening, we need to come down to SCAD, oh, RISD perhaps, imagine? or yes. the Smithsonian has a great comics collection, would love to do a talk at the Smithsonian. Have us out. Brad and I yes. will be smiling from ear to ear. We'll give you two talks. We'll give you three. We'll, yeah. we'll, what do you need? The floor guests. is waxed. We'll do whatever we, we need, coach. We'll, we'll give you, we'll, we'll be there in a limousine. Did I say a limousine? We'll be there in a limousine in a marching band. Did I say marching <laughs> band? We'll, we'll do whatever we can. So yes, that's coming up at the NCS. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Dave, it's time for us to take a question from one of our Patreon backers over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And I love this one. We've been really getting into English language and language in general. Here's another language question. And this uh, says, in terms of writing, is it better to write proper dialect or do you write like you speak? I've been told that when I write, it's not exactly proper English, but it sounds exactly like somebody who is comfortable with phrases would speak. Idioms, contractions, phrasing, etc. I'm not sure it makes sense, but there were a few times in my story that as the verbiage sounds like how people talk, it was a little chewy to read. Ah, uh, so Dave... How do we find the line between writing in proper English and writing the kind of uh, dialogue that makes it sound the way people actually speak? Right. This is a great question. And in a fun way, it's sort of an offshoot or different way of looking at the same question we got a few yeah. weeks back, Brad. Do you remember from our Scottish friend yeah. and the discussion over letterbox versus mailbox versus postal mm -hmm. box versus all that sort of, you know, all the different ways in Eng English writ large, you could say a thing, but yeah. whether or not to lean in on your own uh, cultural specificity, in his case, Scottish, or to go for a more broad business English, you know, the sort of global English that's developing 
um, for business uh, communication. And we suggested at the end of it, just as a recap, maybe it's, and this was a long conversation, maybe it's best to just lean in on your Scottishisms and mm -hmm. lean towards that Scottish audience and go for that. And I will say my initial answer to this question is, if, if you are, say, I'm guessing from the way they wrote this question that they're American or Canadian yeah. uh, based on the word choices. And I would say that if you, you do have the ability to lean into the largest English speaking market with very little trouble mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. by skipping some of these uh, unique language choices that the sort of dialogue choices that you might make the slang choices that you might make but there's also the possibility like we said to our scottish friend like let's say you're a member yeah. of i don't know the skateboarding community or uh, knitting you know and there's very unique language to that slang uh, yeah. of whatever that community is you could also legitimately lean into that and make a yeah. very specific choice and say no the way i speak is the way that skateboarders speak, and I'm trying to appeal to a skateboarding audience, right. but I'm going to lean in on that, and there is enough hundreds of thousands of skateboarders in the world, maybe millions, that I could find an audience there. That's my yeah. initial answer to this one, Brad. What is your initial answer to this? Yeah, I, I, I'm so glad you hit that last point, because the real question is, who is the audience for this comic? Right. That's that's going to make a lot of your decisions for you. Who's who's the audience? Right. I, 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 and, and what are the chances that you're going to be tone deaf to this audience based on the choice that you make? Right. right. Uh, for me, I can tell you how I tend to solve this problem. I'm going to try to uh, go towards what one would call proper English as much as possible, except when like this question asker notes it when it doesn't sound right. Right. If I if I say, oh, Susie, you are the girl for whom I have feelings. <laughs> OK, yes, yes. That's proper English. Sure. Also, you're not making any gains with Susie on that, but keep going. Yes. No, no, you're not. You are definitely not going to the prom. You can tell the marching band to stay home <laughs> at that point. But uh, that is so in, if, in a case like that, I'll say, all right, in that particular case, the proper English does not sound right to my ear. Right. So I'm going to change that. And if it's a little bit less proper, then I'm going to be OK with it. Right. Right. Uh, but 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 it's all everything. There's no there's going to be no rule of thumb on this one. There's going to be no always do this. Never right. do that. Right. It's always going to be in this case. Who's your audience and what sounds right to your ear? And and the last thing you definitely don't want to do is to realize, and I see this a lot, you're making mistakes and you're being called on it by your audience and you're saying, oh, I meant to do that. That's the way he speaks. You, we've seen that so many times. Well, that's just how he speaks. Right. <laughs> if your audience is having trouble following what you're doing and they're noting that in the comments, then you have to listen to that pretty yes. closely yes. Uh, because they're they're giving you feedback that you need and you can't hide behind that whole, well, he meant to do that type right. of thing. So uh, I, 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 but in general, the answer to this question is who's the audience? What's your chances of reaching that audience? And most of all, what's your artistic aesthetic judgment telling you yes. about that decision? Absolutely. Super cosign what Brad just said. And you'll listen carefully. You'll notice that Brad and I are not saying, oh, there's only one King's English and you have to write to that. Right. And, right. and uh, English doesn't evolve and English is... Hey, listen, you're you're talking to two cartoonists, two writers who know that language is a playground and that yeah. English evolves and that a static language is unexciting to write for. So we get it. We understand that writing mm -hmm. to slang and writing to the specific way people talk is fun. But part of becoming a professional writer is writing for the passion that you feel with the language that gives you passion but mm -hmm. also kind of acknowledging that if you make a slight gradation choice in the slang that you use, you can scoop up way more readers with understanding. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just really slight. Um, so it's kind of like how Brad say, Brad and I both say, you're writing for yourself. This is separate from language. You're writing mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. yourself, but you're writing for yourself with an awareness that there is an audience. And that yes. does sometimes uh, necessitate tiny changes in what you're going to write. Because if I was writing just yeah. for myself 
If I was pulling a uh, an Emily Dickinson, I was just like, you know what, this is just for me. I don't, I don't, no one needs to understand this. I would make weirder choices with Drive. Just, I'm just being honest with this. Yeah. But if I'm writing with all the passion and joy and excitement that I have for Drive, but I'm aware that there are tens of thousands of people that are going to read this page, I make yeah. slight modifications to make it a little bit more understandable to a wider audience. I understand that the average adult reads at the sixth to seventh grade level. So that mm-hmm. makes a tiny choice in my or tiny changes in my diction and in my word choice right i understand that i'm writing from an american perspective with american slang but there is an uh, an international audience reading this comic i therefore make tiny little changes in the word choices that are slightly less american um uh and these are just examples so what i'm getting at there is if you're in a skateboarding club if you're a, a scottish writer brad and i get it yes of course language is malleable it's fun it's passionate it's changeable uh slang is one of the great things that english has going for it but tiny little changes sometimes i'm just i'm just acknowledging sometimes mm-hmm. a tiny little change can bring in a slightly bigger audience sometimes a massively yeah. bigger audience and so part of being a professional and not just an amateur or a pro-am is making that kind of distinction Yes. Now, here's where you don't have any wiggle room. Here's one thing you have to do. This is this is a absolute solid. This is a law. You cannot get past this. Everything we set up until now is, ah, you know, use your judgment. This this has no judgment behind it. You need to learn how to use punctuation. Oh, God, yes. Properly. Or you will get pilloried. Yes, yes. Not, a, no, not only pilloried, I, I'm going to tell you. Uh, I've seen somebody try to write, but it, oh, and by the way, by the way, if you're doing humor, you need to go back, rewind the podcast to where I'm telling you that, turn the volume up to 11 and blast it so it makes your ears rattle. If you're working humor, you really need to know how to use punctuation because punctuation is telling that reader how to read the words, in most cases, dialogue. And if you screw that up, you, you, what's the oldest idiom in comedy? Comedy is all about timing. Punctuation is all about timing. Yeah, good, good if point. If you're trying really to do point. comedy yeah. and you don't know how to use a gosh darn comma, and 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 it, uh, it's it's more common than Never you think. Never has a gosh darn been used more uh, <laughs> more as a replacement <laughs> phrase for what Brad wanted to say. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's worth your time to use a tool like Grammarly yeah. and yes. to put your 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 script into that and to listen to what they're telling you uh, in terms of punctuation. I've seen I, I, there was one guy. It was it was a single panel comic with three compound word balloons. Which right off the bat, you got you got three <laughs> compound word balloons in a single panel you you gotta stop and regroup but it was it was i could see what he's trying to do he was trying to you know set this thing up but because he couldn't use a comma correctly i couldn't i I, it took me three times reading it through before i understood what he was trying to say right because those commas had me reading all over or, or the lack of commas had me reading all over the place and i was like I don't know what you're trying to say here. Right, and right. It's frustrating me. So everything we've set up until this point has been loosey goosey and, you know, let your freak flag fly. But holy moly, if you do one thing this year to try and improve your writing, learn how to use a comma and the rest of those punctuation marks that are at your disposal. Yeah. I, and I will say one other uh, uh, big sort of going away uh, mark on this topic yeah. is you had said in your question that, like, I write the way I speak and I, the, the words yeah. I put down are exactly what I say. And Brad and I will acknowledge that's probably true. That's, uh, mm-hmm. that's fine. That's a valid point. But I will just say this. Having done theater, um, <sighs> sketch, and stand-up comedy in my life, the things that you can get away with from spoken English and mm-hmm. still achieve understanding versus what you can get away with for written English and still achieve understanding yes. are markedly different. And you need to understand that. So, yes, what you're writing down is exactly the way you speak. But the problem is written English doesn't have all the sort of contextual clues that a human face can give Right. When you are speaking something. So, for example, listen to any politician's speech that's been transcribed. It looks uh-huh. like a word salad. And you're like, wait, what were they saying? Especially certain politicians. And <laughs> you're like, what? wait, what is the break in this? What is the, I guess there was a thought break here or there was a change in tone or something. Because 
human speech in person by given by a, a person standing there in front of you. There are physical clues. There are facial mm -hmm. tics. There are posture clues. There are energy in the room clues that you get and, and that inform what they are actually trying to say, right? Tone and tonality yeah. and speech, all the sort of patterns of speech. When you have a word on a page, you a little bit got to cheat it. You just got to know that you can't have a perfect transcription in your dialogue of what right. someone would say in real life. Writing is not the same as speaking. That is a truth right. universal, right? And so yeah. you, no matter who you are, whether you're writing the King's English or whatever slang or Scottish, there's got to be a slight modification to allow, as Brad said, for proper punctuation, for proper yep. clausal work, for proper building mm -hmm. and, and denouement of a sentence, right? You can't just have word salad that you would normally have in spoken English. Yeah, yeah. Everything that Dave just said is exactly why it's so important to use punctuation right. Yeah. Because if you're speaking, you've got a hundred ways to say, I could, I could say the same thing to Dave uh, uh, five different ways. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and hey, uh, here you go. Hey, you look good today. That's one way. Now, here's another one. <laughs> you look good today. Here's another one. Well, you look good today. I could do, I could, by the way, I'm such a great actor. I could do that for 10 more iterations and give you 10 more. <laughs> no, but the more. point is made. Cause you could also, yes. you could also do this. I could do this back, back to Brad. <laughs> hey. Yeah. You look good today. <laughs> <laughs> but all of those exact yeah. same words on a page. Yes. Markedly different. I mean, if you want to know the, the most clear example of this, try to mm -hmm. read Shakespeare versus yes. watching professional actors mm -hmm. act Shakespeare. You will yeah. be lost on the written page without the nuance of human expression because it's also, it's 500 year old language, 400 year old yeah. language. So uh, only with the nuance of a professional interpreting that do you go, oh, I see what Shakespeare was saying in this scene. Oh, now yeah. I get it, you know? And so the same is true with Brad in reverse. You can say the same written thing 19 different ways, which is why it's so important in your cart cartooning to have context clues for the characters, context clues for the scene, and proper punctuation. Absolutely. So Dave, we've got time for one more Patreon question. And this, I'm really, in, I, I really enjoy this. Listen to this. I'm in college with a beginning slash amateur knowledge of comics. I'm just trying to get, a, get the hang of making any comic, let alone a good one. My main question is, what do I do for now? I want to make graphic novels, but I've not had uh, more than a little bit of experience making comic strips, and I need some wisdom on this subject. Thank you and have a great day. So the question here is, where do I start? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is great. First of all, how fun, college age, you're, you're yeah. loving comics, you wanna do it yourself, this is great. I'm excited for you, first of all, That's, this is fun. Second of all, I think a version of the answer that both Brad and I will give is you just got to start. Yep. And now I'll give you examples of ways you can start, but you just got to start. And that's the thing. Yeah. Know that the first 30 that you do are kind of just for you. You're, you're really yes. just like figuring out how do I make a mark with this pen? How do, I, mm -hmm. how do I write the dialogue? Where do I put the word balloons? How do I tuck the word balloons and all this art that I've got to fit in this panel? I, I guess I'll figure this out as I go. I will tell you the way I started and see if this is helpful to you. Young Dave kind of tried two different ways to start comics. One was I just did single panel comics, arguably one of the hardest comics it is to do, <laughs> but structurally is the simplest. Structurally, a single panel comic is one visual, one or two lines of text, bada bing, bada boom, you're out. You don't have to figure out yeah. paneling. You don't have to figure out the sequentiality of action. You don't have to figure out editing from moment to moment. It's just one moment, bam, here's a joke about a flying squirrel. Bam, here's a joke yes. about a tree falling in, in the woods and no one hearing it. So a single panel is useful for just figuring out the execution of an idea, a single idea. How do I combine my words with my images? Bam, single panel cartoon. But again, yeah. caveat. Single panel cartoons are arguably one of the hardest things to execute well. So don't beat yourself yeah. up if you get to the end of it. You're yeah. like, no, this makes no sense. But what I'm just saying is when you're starting, it's low hanging fruit for how much drawing you're going to have to do because it's just one panel yes. and how much yes. writing you're going to do because arguably it's going to be under 30 or 40 words. So yeah. that's one way to look at it. Another way that young Dave started his cartooning was 
Brad, you know those college ruled newspaper, uh, 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 spiral bound uh, notebooks? Notebook. Where, you know, it was anywhere from 80 to 300 pages, and it was a spiral yeah. thing on the left, and mm -hmm. uh, college ruled paper. So I, the college ruled is what? A quarter inch every. I don't, I don't even know. A quarter inch, is. yeah. Something like that. Doesn't matter. Anyway, what very young Dave did was. I would take a Sharpie. I would count down 30 lines, draw a line, yep. count down another 30 lines, draw a line. And yeah. anyway, I would do a vertical comic strip in a spiral wow. notebook, just no rulers, no nothing, draw a heavy line in a Sharpie and then draw action dialogue, action yeah. dialogue, action dialogue, action dialogue, bam, four panel it, comic. Yeah. And this was, this was a good 50 years before Webtoons. Uh, oh, yes, this. <laughs> yes, Brad, this was I got to tell you, the, the ballpoint pen had just been invented. We were very excited. Um, yeah. So for me. By, and, and so, by the way, uh, speaking of pens, no pencils were involved. I right. just grabbed a pen. Didn't matter what it was. Mm -hmm. Just started making marks on pages, putting figures in there, figuring out, did I want to draw full size? Three quarter size, just floating heads. How did I do the dialogue? How did I do the word balloons? It was great. Just getting ink on paper practice for Dave Kellett. How about you, Brad? How, yeah. What would you recommend for this person in college just wanting to start somehow? Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to say there is no right answer to this either. This is, this is a very loosey-goosey show, but I don't care. I, I don't care how you start. I just care that you start. I, you can do any number of things, uh, but I... I I don't care. Yeah, you, just you because because also I can tell you how Brad Geiger does a comic strip. And if you're at the very very nascent part of your creative journey or even let, let let's say we haven't taken into account and this person says I'm in college. Well, what if that college is SCAD, for example, right? right? right. So they're or they're a little bit yeah. advanced, yeah, right? Exactly. Uh so I don't care. I, I the last thing I want you to do is overthink this. I don't want you to start going, well, I want to start with my comic, but I'm going to have to figure out my branding first and there's going to be the logo and I'm going to have to get the URL and and uh, figure it out uh, what my Patreon's going to be. No, I don't want any of that. I just want you to start making comics using whatever tools and whatever is in your brain right now. Later on, when you figured out how to make a line of dialogue hit a significant moment, even, you know, like a punchline in three or four panels and how to make that uh, time move between the panels and how to how to compose those panels. All of those things are things that I, I could sit here and tell you for days and there's books out there that'll tell you, you know, what they think that you should do. But the but the, but the truth is, at this point, when you're just starting out, you need to. You need to make all those rookie mistakes and put the word balloons on the bottom of the panel where they don't belong and, <laughs> you know, have the word balloons in the wrong order. Yeah, and then have go the word back balloon a, tails a, crossing, stuff like yeah, that. Just yeah. rookie mistakes. Do yeah. all of that stuff and make all those mistakes and learn from them. But, but the most important thing here is that you do the comic just start doing stuff and once you've yes. been doing stuff for a while then we can talk about uh, panel composition and word balloon placement and, and writing and all those other things that come up but from what you are describing to us what the place that you are at right now i'm not interested in any of that what i'm interested in you doing is uh, a, a repeating this process of doing like a comic strip Agreed. over and over and over again, maybe once a week or twice a week, uh, s setting yourself up uh, with a schedule or a deadline so it feels compelling to you and to get that part done. When you've been doing that for six months uh, to a year and you're still interested in it, then we can talk about improving your craft. I agreed. Big agree. And I will say this might be egoist in the sense that I want you to do it the way I did it. But there is, yeah. I think that there is an advantage to just doing pen on paper, ink on paper, yeah. because, uh, and, and listen, if you want to do digital, fine. If you have some access at, a, uh, at your college to a Wacom or some kind of digital tablet and you want to do mm -hmm. digital, fine. But here's my hesitation in that is that yeah. I just want you to start. And if you're starting, but also having to learn Photoshop or also having to learn CSP or also having to learn how to set up a file, in no matter what program you use, that's a lot uh -huh. harder than just getting out a ballpoint pen and a piece of paper and just immediately starting to make marks, the ones you want to yes. make, right? 
like I just want you to start. And so part of it is, is it the way that I started? Yes. But is it also by hook or by crook easier than having to also learn a, a program really quickly? Yes. Like I just want mm -hmm. you to start. And I think the easiest way is ink on paper to just yeah. get, get something out. And like Brad, once you've done a couple of them, the next step I think is to set yourself a regular schedule. I'm going to do one yeah. a week, right? Mm -hmm. One a week. And so right now this is coming out to you in August. So I would do that until the Christmas break, right? Until mm -hmm. do one a week until Christmas break. Then I think the next stage, if you really want to push yourself is consider in the spring semester, going to your college newspaper or college website or college something, yeah. just seeing if they would allow a, uh, um, uh, somebody to uh, do a comic strip. So might this be for the next couple semesters away? Might this be for next year? That's fine. But what I'm getting at is when you are starting, the first thing is like Brad and I said, just start making marks. Just start making a comic, single panel, multiple panel comics. Even if you wanted to try to swing at a page, uh, a graphic novel page, that's fine. I don't recommend it, but that's fine. Whatever works for you. But down the line, what I want you to do is to jump in on some college outlet because it'll give you both deadlines, which is mm -hmm. great, and it'll give you embarrassment, which is also great. <laughs> like, yes. A little public embarrassment on a cartoon that wasn't understood is great yeah. training ground for a young cartoonist. It's also low stakes it's in college. There's no money involved. Who cares? But yeah. you'll up your game because it's about to go public and, and you don't want all your friends to see it and be embarrassed. And also when it comes out on the website or on a printed thing at college, whatever it's going to be. You'll see at lunch the next day, people be like, oh, that didn't work at all. And you'll see yeah. why it didn't work. It's great feedback for a young college cartoonist. But again, yeah. that's down the road for now. Both Brad and I just want you to make the marks. Yeah. And, and this is coming from a couple of guys. I, I know I my first regular deadline was for my college newspaper doing editorial cartoons. Yeah, and that's too. when I really, really improved my craft uh, for the first time. I really started getting good was because I had I had to think of something for next week. I had to execute it. I had to get it in in time and and so on and so forth. Uh, that that was a big. And if you can yes. find and, and maybe it's not a college newspaper for you, but maybe whatever the equivalent is right. for you. Right. Uh, even if it's unpaid, I wasn't getting paid to do uh, editorial cartoons cartoons at that point but that weekly deadline and having stakes and having skin in the game uh having to explain if there if my if i wasn't able to fill my section of the paper that week uh that was really formative for me that yeah. I, I i know you did uh comics in your school newspaper it was probably the same thing for you yeah oh yeah I, you look uh, notre dame had a daily newspaper by the way which i don't even know wow. if you, there's not a lot of colleges that do that i don't know why they yeah. did it but anyway it was lovely but i so i did five proto sheldons a week my my college newspaper strip was called four food groups of the apocalypse great title <laughs> for if you want to yeah. not make sense to anybody um but uh, it's funny, Brad, the early titles we had for early strips, oh, they're all terrible. Anyway, so I did four food groups for uh, three and a half years at Notre Dame daily. And you look at mm -hmm. that first comic versus the final one. Holy yes. hell, was that a great training ground? I yeah. got so much better in those three and a half years of daily strips. The feedback was amazing. And at the end of it, I was able to make a book that paid for grad school. So like it was bonkers right. good experience. I highly recommend it if you can do a weekly or a monthly outlet for a school newspaper. Again, embarrassment is a great training ground. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and listen, just just like not too long ago, we had some technical issues here on the show, and we were a little bit embarrassed about that. But you know what we did? We came back the next time and did Stronger, the best show taller. we possibly could. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that's how we hopefully have gotten better over the years. But unfortunately, today, we've gotten as good as we're going to get because it's time for me to say that you've been listening to Comic Shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Oh my God! The so hubris of we've gotten as good as we're gonna get, which is why I say you've been listening to comic, comic something. <laughs> Comic shop? I had no idea shop. what that was. Oh. I was running out of breath, oh. and I was hoping I could make it to the end. <laughs> it's delicious. You've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a fool of yourself, and a living from oh. comics. <laughs> Your hosts have, my, have been my friend Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evilcomic.com. 
and my close personal friend Dave Kellett, the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped, and the cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com, Drive at DriveComic.com, and of course, you can check out NewDriveBook.com, where you can see this thing kickstarting in real time. Absolutely. Act 4 of the, the Drive series, but you can also get Acts 1, 2, 3, and 4 over at NewDriveBook.com, along with a lot of add-ons per our earlier oh, question. Yeah. So, there's a lot, <laughs> a lot to be said there. And yeah. I'm going to say... And you know, I, actually, I looked at your Kickstarter, you know, the first thing, first words that come out of my mouth? Yeah. You look good today. <laughs> hey, Brad, you know what? You look good today. <laughs> Language has a lot of nuance, everybody. Uh, the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net, and this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, and we know that you do, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. And don't forget, when you give us those five-star reviews, click five-star, but then click it again. Maybe it goes to ten stars. I don't know how that works. But that's uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, There's only one way to find out. Yeah, maybe you can get us to ten. And Comic Lab is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So we will go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash newdrivebook.com <laughs> <laughs>